Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And before we get to today's guest, let me remind you of something that uh, I was reminded of recently. I had someone write in and said, I listen to your podcast every single week. However, I didn't know you had a YouTube channel. (laughs) This just happened today. I went, what? I have dropped the ball. So guess what? We have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the thriller zone. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Just like our regular website, thethrillerzone.com. Just like our social media, whether you call it Twitter or X, at The Thriller Zone. Same with Instagram. Anyway, now you know. So glad you joined us for today's show. This book I'm telling you about right now, Ricochet, by the author Taylor Moore. You know, when I see people who, who don't have a huge following on social media, I go, hmm, what does that mean? Let me tell you something. This guy is going to be big. He's going to be huge. I'm telling you, I know. Ricochet is, oh, what's that phrase that I always make fun of? Unputdownable. It's a new Garrett Cole, number three in the series, and you're going to love it. Let me stop babbling and let's get right to it because our friend Taylor Moore is in the green room right here on the Thriller Zone. Welcome to the Thriller Zone, Taylor Moore. Hey, it's great to be here, David. Thanks for having me on. Uh, did I don't know if you saw on my social media this little book being bent up in my lap as I was flying back from Colorado Springs. Yeah, that's what I like to see. I like to see them nice and bent up and used and worn. That makes nothing gives me greater joy. But here's what I do. Uh, here, here's my notes that I, as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, don't forget to say this. But this page I'm saving for last because it's my official one line blurb review. Okay. I love it. I can't wait to see it and hear it. You told me just seconds before we came on something about a cold snap. Folks, I think he used the phrase <laughs> cold snap. Now you're, uh, you're north yeah. of Houston, right? Oh, we're way north of Houston. I am in Amarillo, Texas right now. And it's just, uh, for people that know, I mean, for most people outside of Texas, Texas is just Texas. But in reality, Texas is not Texas. Amarillo is just on its doing its own thing out here. We're up on the high plains. It's a completely different climate. Um, for me to drive to Houston, it'd be, I think, nine or 10 hours. Uh, so I had, a, I had some fun with my Ooh. publicist the other day because she just set me up for something. Yeah, you could just pop over to Houston. I was like, no, I don't. there's no popping over. Um, this is a big state and I'm on the far end of it. But yeah, we actually got a little, uh, a little cold snap. I think it's going to be a high of 80 today or somewhere. And everyone else is, is 108. So I'll take it. One of my fondest memories of Texas, I have two specific memories of Texas, if I can take this second to share. One of them was spending a summer in a little town called Longview, Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know of Longview. Yeah, I had never been there before. I went there for a little college prep program, a little squeeze-in refresher course before attending college, and it was hotter than hail. Yeah. Got there in, I want to say, August. Yeah. Ooh, ooh! And the other thing is, I'm I'm leaving uh, Chicago back in '91, heading west, going to LA to chase fame and fortune. 
And I remember hitting Texas and and driving and driving and driving. This is the biggest state I have ever seen. Yeah. Big yeah, state. it's amazing. Well, first of all, how did you end up in Longview? Was there like a possum skinning course or something that you had to take before? What <laughs> what, what on earth would put you in East Texas? That's what I want to know. Uh, let's see. It was a it was a college prep program at at um, Laterna. For right. some reason, my parents didn't think I was smart enough, so they needed a. You know, just in case you missed a few things, David, we're going to send you a little crash course in Longview. Oh, where's okay. that? Oh, it's somewhere in Texas. <laughs> it's just a little drive here from Virginia. Well, maybe uh, so that was going. some sort of like a punishment. If you didn't do well where you're going, they're going to send you back to Longview. Is it maybe one of those uh, carrot and whip kind of a things? I don't know. <laughs> Well, having grown up as a PK, there was plenty of punishment in my life. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No, long, no, East Texas is great. And, and I, I'm not technically from East Texas, but I always say I could throw a rock and hit it uh, from, from where I was in Central Texas. But no, it's great. But it is hot in the summertime. And All right. Now that we've covered weather, we're going to get right mm-hmm. into uh, your book, Ricochet, a Garrett Cole novel. Now, it's my first introduction to Garrett. And I'm going to say right out of the gate, I like this guy. Okay, good. I that's always a, a, that's always a yeah. good start. <laughs> For some reason, and I'm not even sh- sure. Ooh, I'm not even sure that Walt Longmire from the TV series that wasn't Texas that he was in, was it? You'd know that. No, see, Longmire, he's in Montana, right, or Wyoming? I, okay, I get those. Uh, sometimes I get confused. I know C.J. Box. He's got the the Wyoming. Uh, area covered, but I, I think Lon Ma- Longmire is in Montana, but I could be wrong. Either way, it made me think of that, and to me, that is a compliment because I really loved Longmire, and I like C.J. Box books, so you are, in my opinion, uh, in that same arena. I hope that's good in a, in a, in a fair uh, estimation. It's it's a it's a great uh, it's a wonderful compliment for me to be put with those two legends and uh, no absolutely I'll I'll take that all day long uh, for you know a lot of times my editor I've noticed they'll put you know for readers of C J Box she'll like Taylor Moore's you know blah 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 and and I always love that because I think more than anyone C J Box has probably been um, what I try to aspire to in writing uh, you know he's got this long running great series with this sort of singular protagonist, you know, with all this cast of characters that, that you follow through. And that's what I always wanted for Garrett, uh, because, you know, of course, I'm about to finish up book four and turn that into my publisher. Uh, but when you start with Garrett, you know, the protagonist, he's, he's got all this, he's got family, he's got friends, he's got all this, this circle around him. And I wanted people to, to grow uh, with the protagonist and, and with that family and with those, those friendships. And so I, I love what CJ Box has done with that series, because when you start, if I remember correctly, I think the girls are like infants or babies. And and, you know, now we're up I, the last book. I think I read they're they're off out of college or, you know, on that level. So to me, it's fun for a reader. I mean, I'm a fan of, of his series. So it's a fan to grow with the family. And that's that's what I wanted to do. So. I love that comparison. Well, good. And and so you are in good company. <clears throat> and for those folks who don't know uh, Taylor Moore and don't know Ricochet, don't know uh, about this series we're talking about, we kicked off with Downrange, followed up with Firestorm. You got plenty of great reviews on Amazon, lots of nice high numbers on Goodreads, and a couple of things that I got instantly from reading this. And as I said, uh, as you as I mentioned, the photograph and social media – I read half of it from uh, San Diego to Colorado Springs. And as soon as we got on the plane, uh, heading back, I finished the second half. So I got it in two sittings and it was just a great, great read. <clears throat> well, thank you. I appreciate that. And and it's funny you mentioned that. I, I've always, people have always asked me what, you know, there's two, there's two compliments uh, that, that are the highest one. I love to see, like you said, a war uh, a well-worn book, because I think that's a good sign that somebody's really dug into it. Um, but the fact that, you know, you, you read it in these two sittings, I get um, people email me, DM me all the time. They'll say, I sat down and, and, and read that book from start to finish. And there's a, there's a part of me that loves it because I think um, that's wonderful. Uh, there's that other part of me that goes, it took me nine months to write this and you read it in nine hours or whatever. Uh, give me a little break here because everybody wants to know when's the next one, when's the next one. Uh, but no no greater compliment than when people will just sit down there and, and just read them in one, two, three days or something like that. I think it's just great. 
Yeah, and let me let me drill down on that for a second, Taylor, because I'm one of those people, as I was growing up, I wanted a big, fat, juicy book that I could start on a Thursday after class or, you know, maybe Friday morning and just take the whole weekend, maybe even into the next week with. But these days, because my job asks for me to read, you know, two to three books a week, I, I can't I don't have that luxury. However, it is a great compliment in that when you get to reading and you're caught up in the story and the characters and then and I'm going to get on I'm going to I'm going to bring this point up again a little bit later in the show but you have a great technique at the end of every chapter that just makes your hand go boop I mean you cannot yeah. stop from turning that page so it, it it's a compliment but I I am with you because <laughs> I remember reading or rather writing my first uh, patent Detective Pat Norelli story. And I'd worked two years on that stinking thing. And I'm, I'm not in the caliber of you, for instance. But I had finished that. I handed it off to my brother-in-law. He ripped through it. He's like, man, I love this. When's the next one? I'm like, I just finished that one. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So. I know. It, it's, a, it's a great compliment. But it, it's one of those where you go, okay, now now here we go again. You know, And you start on that next one. But but no, I appreciate you saying that. You know, like you, you mentioned the, the hooks that I do. And, and, and that's another thing that I get when people write to me. They say, like, I kept waiting for resolution. I kept waiting to get to a place where I could put the book down. I'll say, I don't give you resolution. You get to resolution when you get to the end. And and, and, and that's the only time you're going to get it. So it, it's a fun thing. But I work really hard to keep those pages turning. And and, and I recognize, you know, that, that people, there's a lot of competition for, uh, for, you know, in terms of entertainment of what people can choose these days. It's not like the old days when you have, uh, maybe it's a few TV shows and a and, and a book to read. I mean, there's a lot of competition. So if I'm gonna keep, if I'm gonna grab people's interest, I know I've got to do a good job at that. So I work uh, really really hard. Well, you do that, and uh, I'm not going to take the time to read that opening paragraph. But that opening paragraph sucks you in instantly. And <clears throat> I kept thinking to myself, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be real honest with you because I have read a lot of books. And I've read a few of these books that the, a guy or a gal will start writing and you go that first chapter or two, you're like, man, you're off to the races. And then it kind of peters out. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, so for some reason, in the back of my head, I was reading this. I'm like, let's see what Taylor's got. Let's see if he's got the juice to keep that thing going. Yeah. And you turned on the heat and you just kept the heat going. I don't think I really caught my breath. I want to say down around chapter nine, chapter 10, I was like, oh, okay, I got a little respite now. That's about all I ever give anyone. And it, you'll see it, it's like that in all my books. And um, there was something when I set out to write a, a series and, and I did a lot of research and I went to the library and I would, I would get stacks of books. And I would, there, was, there were things that, you know, and these were great authors. The stories were good. The characters were good. The writing was good. But there is, you know, we, we, you know, as authors, we always talk about the mushy middle, right? I mean, and we've all gotten to that book that starts off really great and it may end great, but there's that mushy middle where the character just sort of like meandering around and you're going like, what are you doing? Let's like, this is get, this is get to this thing. And so that was one of the things that I, when I started that series, I really wanted to start, you know, I want to start with a bang. I want to give you a little time to sort of sink in, get to know the characters, get to know what the problem is. And then when I take off, we, like it, it literally never sl slows down. And I try to give people a little bit of breath, bre you know, like catch your breath a little bit here and there with some scenes that maybe are more meaningful. But I, I never want that yeah. tempo to really slow. I want people to sink their teeth in and be like, and just keep those pages turning. Well, as I say, mission accomplished. <clears throat> All right. Now, there's a couple of things I instantly got from reading this, and I want to know how on point I am. Okay. No, it's about three things. Number one, you're from Texas or have really done a heck of a lot of research because Texas feels as much of a central character as some of the main characters in the book. Yeah, the um, no, that's absolutely uh, true. I, I, in fact, uh, at Craft Fest this year, right before Thriller Fest, they invited me up to teach a class called "Your Setting as a Character." And uh, one of the things, that, and again, that's one of the, the the feedback that I get from readers all the time is that I felt like Texas or the High Plains was another character in the book, and that that's what I really wanted to do. You mentioned uh, the Longmire series and the CJ Box series, and um, I think I think that's one of the things that I've loved about those uh, those two those two authors is that that sense of place that you get when you're reading those books. Um, 
I, with, with CJ Bucks in particular, I always say he has done a great job of world building. And I know this world exists, yeah. but it doesn't exist for me because I've never been up there. I'd love to go. But but I am as fascinated uh, with uh, Wyoming and, and that part of the world as I am with the characters that are in the book. I want to know more about it. And so I really, when I started writing about the High Plains, yes, I'm from here, lived here, worked here, I've done all these different things. And so all these characters you're reading about, they're real people. Uh, they're, they're just, you know, sort of an amalgam of you know, human beings that I've met over my time and, and put them in and thrown them into a, a character or two. But, um, but that was one of the things I really wanted people to feel what it's like to be here. And again, I... I get readers all the time that'll write to me and say, man, now I really want to go to the High Plains. I really want to go to the Texas Pan. I want to visit this. And my, my first thought is like, well, that's great. And then my second is like, everything in my books, it's always trying to kill you in some form or fashion. Why do you want to come to this place where you might die? Because it's it's always sort of dangerous. But I guess there's a certain lure uh, to it that people enjoy. Sure. Reaching for the fire. So, all right, so number two, it uh, looks as though you've spent some time in some sort of intelligence work. Now, I don't yeah. know. Um, could it have been CIA? Taylor? Yeah, yeah. I spent some time in the CIA, and then I went uh, did contract work with the military. So essentially took those skills and helped out, uh, helped out our soldiers. Now, without getting drilling too deep or, uh, <coughs> excuse me, going to a place that, you know, I can't. Can you give me even a whisper of a feel what a day in the life of a CIA agent is like? I mean, is it is it on this side? It is as much like any other nine to five it is or if it or it is is a, a lot like television. Um I'd love to tell you that it's like television, <laughs> but those those moments are kind of few and far between. Although they do happen, they they really do. Uh, you do have those really cool TV moments, but I think uh, it's mostly like any other job. You're spending a lot of time in front of a computer. There's a lot of prep work. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of writing and emails and meetings and uh, and things like that that you're when you're getting ready uh, for those kind of things. But but I had a great experience as a CIA uh, intelligence officer because I got to as a writer because I got to I started in the Directorate of Intelligence, which is the analysis side. So when we think about the original Jack Ryan, the guy, you know, going to briefings and meetings and, you know, telling people, you know, writing up these reports and being a subject matter expert, I got to do that, and, which was really cool in its own right, because you're meeting with high level, um, you know, officials and, and you're, you're writing for the president. You're doing all those, those fun things that have an impact on policy and, and what the war fighter is going to do. And then, uh, then I ended up moving to the operations side. Uh, so I went through that training and went through the more, the traditional spy trade craft of, you know, what you do of the secret clandestine meetings and getting information, listening information from the people that you need again, to sort of answer those questions that policymakers, the warfighter might have to, um, either guide their direction or keep them safe or whatever it is. And so, uh, so again, from a writer's perspective, it was great because I saw two different worlds. And even while I was at the agency, I, I did a, a stint in the operations center. Everybody always hears about the operations center and that's the DCI, you know, you're, you're supporting the director and you're, you're supporting the PDB briefers. And so you're literally at the, you know, the, the tip of the spear in terms of information, dissemination on, on what the president is hearing you're up there like uh, helping them get the most up-to-date whatever it is happening in the world whatever explosion whatever disaster whatever um assassination you're right there and and so i, I got all of this perspective while i was at the agency which was re really great for writing wow what a daunting gig that would feel like and, and again i know some of that is because we've never been there and you might say, oh, it must be a daunting gig to stand uh, in a studio and be on the radio and talk to millions of people in New York City. And I'd go, yeah, but it's just like any other job. So uh, I, yeah. I kind of get that. Yeah, I think it's because sure. we romanticize. Maybe that's what it is. Romanticize some of it. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's a certain amount of that. But um but uh, yeah, you have your down times, but then there's there's the moments that you'll never forget or, you know, there was the times you were uh, doing some things that, you know, when I was there, literally you think a movie could be made about this or a book could be written about this. And it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to be a part of that. Although I never claim to be the, the lone guy out there doing it. It's it's a group effort. It's a team effort for sure. And so everybody's got their piece to play and they're they're when they're doing this. And so, uh, but no, it, it was a fascinating uh, time in my life and, and glad I got to do that kind of work. 
Yeah. And my third point there, uh, as I'm refreshing everyone's memory here, as I'm reading for this, I want to see how on point I am. There Now, there's something that tells me either you're a believer, have some kind of a genuine affinity to a particular flavor of religion, because in a thriller as such as this, you don't hear a lot of reference to God or there's prayers throughout, and it, it, there must be some truth in that, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm, I am a Christian and uh, a practicing Christian, and that's my faith is very important to me. And so because it's important to me, it's important to Garrett. And so, you know, if anybody reads the books, they're not particularly what you call a religious book or anything, but it, there is that element. And I think that's, you know, that, that's sort of ingrained in us as uh, not everyone in, in Texas, but I grew up on a ranch and I grew up in, you know, farming and all that. And uh, you're so dependent on uh, the weather and all these factors that uh, that come into play, man. You, you get down on your knees um, multiple times throughout your life and just hope for, you know, you're just praying for the best uh, outcome for what you do. I mean, because it's it's such a factor in your life. Uh, and in Garrett is no different. I've, I've instilled that in him uh, because of the way he's brought up and um, and just through the trouble. You know, his family, if you go back to book one, there's a lot of family drama and turmoil and things that have happened, the disasters that have, that have you know affected their family. But that that faith is something that he always turns back to. And, uh, and so it's become a, a, an important part of the series. Yeah, I like it. I think it was a nice little touch and <clears throat> you didn't heavy hand it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, the only other person or persons that I can think of that have a similar influence is uh, Andrews Wilson in some of their books. But uh, mm-hmm. no, it's just an, a, another aspect of the character that I enjoyed. Now, since uh, it's clear your past jobs feed your uh, current passion of storytelling, I, um, I, I wonder, can you share with my audience uh, what, what maybe was one of those um, superb past occurrences like you mentioned oh there's a moment in my caa cia career where you know it was like a scene in a movie was there something that happened that you were like oh now this right here i'm going to hold on to because of, i'm guessing that you've always wanted uh, had an affinity toward writing i'm going to use this later yeah so so it's a great question because really the whole premise of the series is based on one moment uh, when I was at the CIA. And because people ask me all the time, they said, you're writing about Garrett, who's in the DEA, but you were former CIA. And I had done a a, a fair amount of counter narcotics work when I worked with the military, but it's a very different, it's not law enforcement. It's, it's very looking at places like central and South America and looking at zones and routes and who's involved in this kind of thing. So it's a very different uh, perspective of of what a law enforcement, uh, someone in, you know, that would be doing that job would be doing. But, but, um, but for me, what, what happened was, uh, I remember being in a meeting one time and this was at the CIA and it was multi agency and, and someone there. And this, this person actually was from the FBI, but, uh, this person kind of raised their hand and said, look, I, I don't understand what you people do. And what he meant was not, not literally, he didn't understand what the CIA does, but it was just our perspective. Uh, our, you know, what he said, he said, look, we're out making friends. We're, we're doing all these things with people around the world. Um, you don't seem to do that. And, and this guy, way more senior than me, I was just part of the meeting, said, no, we don't do that. We steal secrets. That's what we do. And, um, and, and it's just a different perspective, a different mindset. The CIA is not um, – really there to be your friend. We, we do have allies and call, you know, people around the world that we work with very closely. But at the end of the day, you're there to steal secrets. You're, you're there uh, as the tip of the spirit for the United States government, you know, in terms of finding out what threats are, are out there to our country. And, and so I just remember the guy sort of shaking from the FBI, just sort of shaking his head. And, and the person who said it just didn't back down a bit. And, uh, and so I always thought with Garrett, what if you took this sort of law and order cowboy, you sort of mentioned, mentioned the religious aspect, a guy who, you know, is, is pretty you know, clear on black and white and what's right and wrong. What if you put him in that gray world of the CIA? What would happen? What would it look like? How would he react? And so if you go back to Downrange book one, that's exactly what happens is you, you take this sort of black and white cowboy and put him in that gray world and let him maneuver in that CIA world for a while. And so, uh, you know, the question will become, does, does, does he change that world? Does that world change him? How, how will he, uh-huh. how will he maneuver? How will he operate without really losing his soul or, or losing his way? And, uh, so that to me, that was what kind of helped launch that series. Wow. That's a great way to look at it too. 
And, you know, without sounding uh, too technical, I want to say that <clears throat> there's something that you, you show this uh, superb mechanics uh, as you get, as you dish out uh, details. It, but however, you don't do it by complicating the story with superfluous words. And what I mean by that is sometimes I get barraged by all this explanation of stuff that I go, okay, already, just get onto the action or get onto the story. And what you do is you 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 dollop in little tidbits of the information that I need to know because I'll even I'll even I caught myself going, <clears throat> all right. Well, Garrett's doing this, but I mean, does he know how to blank? And within the next couple of sentences, boom, here's here's how he not only did the knife suddenly appear, but here's why the knife is there. That's why the knife is hidden, et cetera. So little things like that. Uh, and, I, and I don't want to beat a beat it at horse, but it's like you you give me just enough detail without uh, bombarding me with a minutia of words and details. Does that make sense? So, yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And just so you know, that, that is not by accident either. I work really, really hard to do that. And and one and, and it, it involves a lot of cutting on my behalf later on. I, I, I probably do have superfluous words, you know, throughout. And I go in and go, nope, we don't need that. Nope, we don't need that. Here's what we need. Here's the basics because I want to keep people going. But the biggest thing, the biggest part of that for me as a writer is I never want to take uh, the reader out of that point of view of, of whoever they're reading about. And so there's that danger when you go from that person's head to narrator voice. And I never want, I never want to get into that narrator voice because I never want the reader to not think that they are seeing through the eyes of whoever they're they're reading about at that moment. Uh, so if I do have like historical facts in there, um, it, there's usually a reason, like it's usually in their head, like, oh, I've seen this. I love this place over here, or this place means a lot to me, or, um, or, or there's a reason there's not just random historical facts. I'm, I'm painting a dirty picture of something. I'm painting something a little bit uh, ugly and sinister, and you're going to get a little historical context with that, but it'll be that character remembering it. And you, you might not even notice that it's happening, but that's the point, is that you're not jumping out of narrator's voice. You're always in their head. That is so good because I never I never thought about it. Well, I didn't, I didn't tear it apart and analyze it quite as much as you just did, but that makes so much sense because sometimes the narrator can get in the way. But I, I felt like I was always... I, you know, it was a combination of front row seat inside his head on a rare occasion. You'd pop in somebody brand new that I hadn't met yet. I'm like, well, oh, oh, wait, where did they come from? But if you just hang in there a sentence or two, you go, okay, got it. It's a new, yep. new character. Yep. Um, here's another thing I love. You got, you, you use a nice little bit of humor throughout. And uh, again, there's a couple things there that makes this book unique, a little bit of faith, a little bit of humor inside all this hell breaking loose stuff that's going on. So uh, kudos to you there. Thank you. <laughs> I suppose you could call it a, uh, not, I want to give you all these great compliments because I'm, I'm going to come around in the other direction now. Okay. <laughs> I think you can call it an occupational hazard. The way I see patterns and uh, recall repeated phrase. I, for some reason, my brain is just picks up on that stuff. And just ask Chris Haughty, who was on my show. We, we had a sit down in, on May 17th episode. <laughs> yeah. And I called out one of his phrases that he uses because there are phrases. Every author, I do it too. We all, yeah. uh, we've got a phrase or a turn of a phrase that we really love. Yours is so and so held up their hands and pushed the air. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I've got it now. I got to write that down when I get off. So I'll just you know, do it, do a, a search for it, and get rid of it. <laughs> now I did not do this because I didn't want to look like I was insulting you. The first uh -huh. time I caught it, I'm like, oh, because it's a visual thing, and and it's basically, whoa, hey, yeah. don't come at me like that. You're pushing the air. Mm -hmm. But then you use it a second time, and I'm like, wow, I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone use that phrase. Well, by about the seventh time, I'm like, oh, okay, there's <laughs> Taylor's little pet phrase. Okay. And that, I'm glad you put I, I need to send you my drafts before they go anywhere. <laughs> you're, you're my new editor. You didn't know you were going to get that job. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, 
You know, I think what happens, what it, you do, of course, every author struggles with echoes, right? I mean, there's that echo, and what, what and for any non writers out there, an echo is a, a, just a repeated word. And you think, well, that doesn't sound that big of a deal, but it does when you're reading it, it hits the ear wrong. And so a lot of times I'll find them and then I'll just replace it with something that echoes somewhere else. I, I, and I do that all the time. Yeah. Like, how did I miss this? And, and it's, it's probably would be laughable if somebody was watching me do this. Cause you're like, you're just replacing that one with that, with another word that's right <laughs> above it. But I think that's what happens, but no, thanks for pointing that out. Cause I'll, I'll make sure to book four is about to get turned in. So I'm, I'm definitely going to do a, a search for that. Well, ask my wife, I have this tendency <clears throat> and I think it's just pattern watching. I don't know what that is in my brain, but I just see patterns. And the minute I see it, I can see it repeatedly everywhere. Now, the good yeah. news is it's, it's served me well in a lot of different careers. Uh, for people who are overly sensitive, it doesn't come across as a compliment. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, another funny one, and somebody brought this up one time and uh, they said, did you really love the movie Tombstone? I said, oh, uh, absolutely. One of my all time favorites. They said, well, you've used a couple of things that are like similar and I really didn't mean to. And I never want to like, you know, I mean, you just hate that, that you do something that, that, uh, and they were like, oh no, I thought it was really cool. I thought, you know, Garrett, like he probably was, he is a Tombstone character. I said, they're all kind of like that, but no, sometimes there's stuff that just seeps into your head and you just, it just becomes part of you too. Well, it's, it's all good Taylor. I'm not, no complaints here. I do think, uh, it's funny. One of your specialties, which really resonated, um, with me as I realized probably around 26 or 27, I remember, <clears throat> let's see, cause let me double check. Yeah. 58. Yeah. I'm, I'm halfway. I'm just about to land in Colorado Springs and I found my, I actually caught myself going, oh, and that's, what, and here's what it is. I'm like, wait a minute, between his setups and then the way you do that crescendo at the end of each chapter, I'm like, man, this is like, this is like screenwriter stuff. And then I went, wait a minute, did I read? And I flipped the here on the back and I go, oh yeah, he now lives in Texas, full-time author, screenwriter and speaker. And I'm like, there you go. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, um, it's a compliment for certain because, it, you know, it's, again, that little thing to get you to turn the page. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, it's a, funny there's a, something like that clicks. It does. And, and you know, it's funny. I, I, I never read my reviews, but for some reason, I, I started reading reviews the other day. I think I was probably just procrastinating because I didn't want to write or something. And so I was like, I better read these reviews I haven't <laughs> read in years, you know. And, and someone said, this guy writes like a screenwriter, you know, of course, it was saying it in a bad way. But, but you know, there's some truth to it because um, I, there's a lot of what I take into, I think the way people read now is a little bit different than maybe, uh, than maybe it was in years past. And so I, I like I said, I mentioned there, you know, there's there my heroes that I have, uh, Larry McMurtry was one of them. I, I, I take, take a lot of the sort of character building from him because I love those like wacky characters that he would put and, you know, like uh, the last picture show and that, that whole series that just kept going. I, I love those sort of Texas uh, characters that are just say funny things and do funny things and have funny reactions. Um, CJ Box, as I mentioned, I love his tempo and pacing. I love uh, the way he does that, that, that setting. But, um, but when it comes to like how I do my pacing in terms of, of chapters, I, I, I pull a lot from, from film. Um, one of the one, what I've always really loved is if anybody's watched Narcos, Narcos Mexico, that series on Netflix. I love that sort of multiple points of view where the, the reader or the, the viewer in that case is watching these things play out. You're seeing the bad guy. You're seeing the good guy. You're watching it all come crashing down. And there's maybe multiple storylines that are all going on at the same time. They may be related. They may be unrelated, but but it's all happening. I love that idea of all these things just sort of coming together. So I do. There's a little bit of visualization on my part as I write um, that uh, that I think is probably, uh, you know, I think a lot of people enjoy it. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe some people don't, but but um, but I think it's it's helped me. Uh, I think it's helped me to generate with that, that sort of tempo that you talked about earlier, where you really get going and kind of hook people in towards towards the end of the book. Yes. And a couple of things. First of all, the people who <clears throat> have have maybe not the greatest things to say about that, I want to say hooey, fooey, bluey. You know, <laughs> forget about it. Move yeah. along. Who cares? Scre I mean, I also want to say this. 
Oh, uh, excuse me, uh, Ding Dong. Can you tell me something? Do you enjoy television? Yeah. Do you enjoy movies? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about this guy who happens to have that particular talent in along with being able to craft great long form narrative like he is? Don't you see a little bit of the benefit there? Yeah. Move along. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> That's number one. Number two is, uh, and I'm going to save, I was going to save this for later, but let me okay. see where it is. Do I say, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is my question. How many people have told you what I'm about to tell you, having worked in and around Hollywood for several decades, that this story is handcrafted for a television movie or a television series or a movie? How many people have told you that? Well, a lot. Um, and, and, and I guess the good news exactly. is I've had a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of Hollywood interest. <laughs> so that's good. And I'm, I'm, I'm pointing the arrow back to Ding Dong, who said, well, I don't like people to write like a screenplay. Blah, blah. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I bet you dollars to donuts that you're going to be sitting at home on your big fat ass watching a little bit of uh, Ricochet <laughs> or some other Taylor Moore story in the very near future. Yeah, well, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully that move. Soapbox is now moved. <clears throat> there, there you go. <laughs> now, I want to say this about Garrett Cole, because as we kind of start down the road to wrapping up, I like Garrett Cole. I like this guy. I, he's a hero I admire. He He's a guy I want to read again. You know, I want to know. I can't wait to see how his love story blossoms yeah. without getting too romantic on it but it yeah. is nice to <laughs> little sprinkle in a little love story in amongst all the murder and mayhem mm -hmm. so i want to know where did he come from i know it's going to be an amalgamation story but give it to mm -hmm. me anyway and what's his secret sauce that makes him different from all the other lone soldier heroes that we have come to like uh, there's a great, yeah, there's a great story, uh, to where Garrett, uh, came from. He was actually the, the, the book that I got my agent, the manuscript that I got my agent with, uh, Garrett was a side character in that novel and he was never the protagonist. He was always the guy helping the other guy. And as I was writing, uh, I began to feel, uh, like Garrett was stealing the show a little bit. Um, but I didn't want to admit to that, that to myself because that would have mean, writing a whole new uh, novel or, or, you know, planning out a whole new series with a whole different character. But it was my agent, John Talbot, fantastic agent, who's, who really like was the one that, that pushed that. He was the one that said, Taylor, he said, that's your guy, that's your protagonist right there. And, uh, and so John, I, I got to give my agent credit for that. He had the, the vision for Garrett. And like I said, I always kind of felt like, I always kind of knew that, but just didn't want to admit it. Cause I didn't want to have to go back to the, the trouble of starting brand new but i did and, and so john uh encouraged me to to start up start fresh so imagine for all you writers out there you finally land your agent and you're you've got this book that you've written four or five times only to have your agent tell you let's trash this thing and let's start fresh but that's exactly what i did and it was exactly the right call and um and so this is a hard job this is the hardest job i've ever had by far is is writing these novels, but, but I did it. I, I, I started fresh with Garrett Cole. Oh, and your second and question was, was why is he, what makes him different? I think there's a level of vulnerability uh, to Garrett that you don't find, you know, a lot of these guys, some either have no flaws or some flaws, like, you know, maybe they got PTSD or something, you know, no, nothing wrong with that flaw or there, but, um, but I think Garrett, there's nothing really technically, you know, he doesn't really have PTSD to speak of. He's got his war stories and he's got his demons from the past, but he's just a normal guy. Uh, you, you know, he's just yeah. a normal guy trying to do the right thing. And um, and he, uh, I, I think he's, you know, I think the fact that, okay, well, I'll give you another story. You didn't ask this question, but uh, people yeah. always ask me, you know, another thing that you try to put in the book. And I, I said, I try to put things in my novel series that are relatable to everyone because mm -hmm. getting chased down by cartel Sicarios hopefully isn't relatable to everyone or having Rus Russian mercenaries chase you uh, hopefully isn't uh, relatable to everyone. But family drama, that's relatable. Having, you know, a, a rift with your family, having a, a lost, having lost a loved one early on in life 
and everyone's sort of reeling, still reeling from that is, is something that people can relate to. Uh, running into an old high school crush after years of having not seen this person is relatable. So there's all these relatable stories that happens with Garrett, and he handles them just like we would. I mean, he may be a Green Beret, former Green Beret, or just this tough guy, but he fumbles and falls and says the wrong thing and does the wrong thing. He becomes, uh, he's got a dad that he doesn't know how to deal with. You know? and, and so I, I think there's a lot of fun things about Garrett that, that people can relate to. And I think that makes him, I think that makes him, makes us like him and want to be his friend and, uh, and want to get to know him more because he's multi multi-dimensional. You know what? That is exactly, you couldn't have put it better. That's exactly why I like him because he feels like, he feels like one of us. He, he's, you know, <clears throat> sometimes I get a little tired and maybe it's because I've watched too many action heroes. But when you have characters that are absolutely flawless, it takes me out of the story because I'm like, really? You can handle every single weapon and every knife and every gun and you know every little trick and you know how to kill everyone with your hands and you remember. And sometimes I go, and, you know, and, and yes, we do dive into that pool in order to swim in that world. However, sometimes like this book, Ricochet, yeah, I go, he's, he's an ordinary guy trying to figure it out and get through there trying to raise a kid that, you know, comes from a different generation and a different, uh, ethnic background and a girlfriend that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. uh, uh, kudos to you, by the way, I want to circle back to something and give some yeah. great big old love props to John Talbot, John Talbot, who runs at yeah, Talbot fortune, uh, is this is where, where John is, who's John was with. So John is one of those guys. He shows up at Thriller Fest. Not a big gaggle of agents show up to Thriller Fest, but I think every time I've gone, he's been there taking meetings, listening to stories. And uh, I have a deep respect for that guy because he has discovered some really solid talent, such as yourself, and, uh, and, and seems to be a writer's agent. And I know that sounds like, well, yeah, duh, dude, that's what they're there for. But sometimes there are business guys and then there are guys who are like, no, man, I, I really love the craft of the story. You know what I mean? John, so you, you hit the nail on the head. There are, he is a writer's agent and there are agents that are just part of the business. I know uh, other writers who don't really know their agents. They're just like these people that they deal with once a year when the book comes out or when they're you know negotiating a, a contract. Uh, John is my friend. Uh, I consider him a person I would confide things in and, and uh, a person that I genuinely like and want to hang around with. And he's, He's such a talent. He's got good instincts. He's good at his job. Um, he's he's humble. He, he'll he'll tell you that he doesn't always get it right, but uh, he's he's one of those guys that can admit when he's wrong. Uh, but but he's got good instincts and he's good at it. And he's he's particularly for what we do for the type of books we write. Uh, he loves the genre uh, and it shows. And and uh, so no, I've been very fortunate to have John um, you know by my side through this process. And no, he's great. Yeah, well, kudos to you, John, and uh, maybe he'll pick up one of my books one day. <laughs> Here, this just in, last from my high praise department, comes my one-liner blurb that, in my honest opinion, nails the description of this book, and you are free to use it in future book blurbs, okay. if so All right. necessary. All right. This ricochet is Yellowstone meets Mission Impossible with a complex hero you instantly root for. Love it. <laughs> Boom. How can you? Yeah, no, I'll take it. I will, I will take that description all day long. I love it. Absolutely love it. My, <laughs> Let me share this with you. As I was flying back, finishing the book, my wife goes, okay, because she loves, She. I'll give her the, Sometimes I wish I would record these because I'll give my instantaneous like 60 second download on a book. <clears throat> and as I said, I, I've, I read a lot of them and she goes, okay, well, cause she saw me ripping through this and she's over there reading uh, Chris Hottie's <laughs> the devil, you know, on the outbound yeah. and I'm, <laughs> and I'm writing, reading this and she goes, so what is it? I'm like, you know what it is? It's Yellowstone meets mission impossible. She went, <laughs> Bam! To quote you, David, bam! I'd read that. Yeah, like, yeah you will. <laughs> there you go. That's that's what Hollywood needs to hear right there, man. I mean, to, 
get, does it get any bigger than those two? So put those together and yeah. Yeah. So, so there you have it. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. I not sure that Yellowstone was my absolute favorite series, but I'll tell you what, uh, two things. I love me some Kevin Costner, man. The guy's just, you know, yeah, he's a legend. And <laughs> also Taylor Sheridan. Yeah. And, and, and can Taylor Sheridan write or what? This guy is, is so prolific. Um, I'm just, I, I don't know anyone who's done what he's done in history. I'm sure there's someone that's that, but I mean, to put out as much as he's put out, that's been solid for the past few years is just, I don't know how that, some people it's like they have, they've cloned themselves and Taylor Sheridan would have had to have cloned themselves to do what he's done in the past few years. He has, uh, folks, if you don't know Taylor Sheridan, look him up. I'm, I'm going to get him on the show. That is going to be one of my dream goals before Christmas is to get Taylor Sheridan because there is, I want to drill into his psyche. How in the wide world of storytelling do you craft a hit after a hit after a hit after and make every episode just as good as the last? I mean, that is hard. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how he does that. It's amazing. See, I loved his movies. I start off with the Sicario franchise and Hell or High Water. And um, I tell people all the time, if you like Hell or High Water, I mean, a lot of the, the you know, my series is kind of Hell or High Water. It's that same part of Texas. It's that sort of gritty, uh, dark side of things that not everybody sees. And uh, so, no, I'd, I'd love to. He, Taylor Sheridan is a hero of mine, uh, along with yeah. CJ Box. Uh, those guys are just doing amazing things. And um no, real, real heroes, man. Just talented guys. Yeah, but not to distract from Taylor Sheridan. To from distract from Taylor Moore, because here's a name that you're going to be remembering for years to come. Now, when we get off camera, I'm going to talk about this cover because I'm a fanatic for good covers, and I'm going to I'm going to give you my honest opinion about this cover. At first glance, this is a solid. It's a solid cover. I'm going to say that. Okay. But I'm going, to, I'm going to share some notes with you. But I'm going to only okay. you because it's going to sound like I'm bad mouthing it and I'm not. Okay. Um, all right. Where lastly? Oh, can I do this? Can I tur- before we go? Can I turn this into a little bit of a commercial? Because I learned sure. as I was drilling down that someone uh, the the company that built your website built my website, and that's mm-hmm. AuthorBytes.com. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've sent uh, a lot of people to Author Bytes because uh, I get a lot of questions like, where, who does your site? Uh, do, do you recommend them? Highly, highly recommend Author Bytes. In fact, I, I recommended them. I think yesterday or the day before, somebody uh, had a question, and I sent them that way. No, highly recommend them. They do a great job. It's a good staff, a good group of people. Um, can't say enough good things. If you're looking for your website, I'm gonna. Here's the plug. All right, here it comes straight up. If you want a website like taylormorebooks.com or davidtemplebooks.com, go to authorbytes.com. And I'll tell you what, if you do, they're going to give you uh, three months free with a one-year contract. But uh, the I just thought it was so interesting because your website looks delicious. Yeah, I love my website. Now, those guys, and, and, I'll t- and just another little uh, note, and they probably will get mad at me for saying this, but... Uh, I, I came to them in kind of uh, hat in hand, uh, like in a hurry. I can't remember which book this was was coming out. Maybe it was the first one. I, 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 you know, you kind of lose track. But I was like, I really need this soon. They're like, we'll get on it, and they did, and they had it ready before the before. So they could have just said, hey, look, get in line, but they didn't, and uh, and and they were really good about jumping on it. So no, can't say enough good things. Yeah, Stephen Ken, authorrights dot com. Good people. All right, well, folks. Speaking of which. If you are looking for more information about our good friend Taylor Moore here, go to taylormorebooks.com. Just like that, you can also follow him on Twitter and all the other social media channels. Although I guess I got to call it X now. I'm still getting used to that, Taylor, so bear with me. I know, me too. <laughs> but boy, has this been good. What what a pleasure talking to you. Fun, fun talking to you too, David. It's a good conversation, great questions. In fact, you had some a few questions that I'd never had before, and I always love to get something new, and it makes me think. And, and to me, that's a lot of fun. Well, you're you're a you are definitely a uh, a talent to just latch on to for some time to come. I, I forgot to mention our good friends Brad Taylor here on 
The cover says a riveting thriller with a family in crisis at the core. And Brad knows something about that. He writes similar books of that quality. But I'll tell you, this is, this has to be in the top 10. Uh, you know, if I keep saying that, Taylor, if I keep saying these books are in the top 10, my, my list is going to turn to 30. <laughs> so I'm going to have to stop. I'm going to have to start saying my top 30. Well, start, start, start saying that uh, after we get off, uh, but keep me in the top 10 and then start saying top 30. How about that? <laughs> Fair enough. Once again, uh, folks, Taylor Moore, the website is taylormorebooks.com. The book is Ricochet, and it drops tomorrow. This show will drop on Monday the 28th, and the book drops on Tuesday the 29th. All right, once again, Taylor, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me on. Your front row seat to the best thrillers. The Thriller Zone. Where's Momo and Popo?